All right, I think uh, we're good to go. Hello, uh, Chicago CABDA. Um, my name is Richard Thorpe. I'm the founder and managing director of GoCycle. I left McLaren Cars in 2002 to start the company. And uh, I guess that makes me a pioneer in the industry. Um, we launched our G1 back in 2009, so we've been in business for a decade. And you might have heard recently that we've just announced our Generation 4 uh, Go Cycle launch, which I'm incredibly excited about. I might be able to sneak in a, a quick uh, sneak peek of that later. But I'm here today to talk about the evolution of the electric bicycle. Um, I kind of uh, call it e-bike 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. I think we're at 3.0 right now, in, in my understanding of, of how I see the e-bike landscape. And I don't know, in the next uh, years, probably within five years, maybe we'll transition into e-bike 4.0. Uh, but before we start, um, something about uh, GoCycle here. We're on the Barwell Business Park in Chessington in the UK. That's about 10 miles south of central London. And we're actually on a business park that has two other pretty big bike companies. Um, you could almost say we've got a little bit of a cluster going on here, which is uh, our friends at Specialized and also Canyon Bicycles. And I'm very uh, sad to say, you might have heard some news, but uh, this is fresh off the press here. Um, I was in the office here uh, last weekend and um, left on, on the Saturday at about 12. And I'll just walk you over. Um, at about 6.30, someone uh, said there was a fire. Uh, that's the specialized building there. It's quite a big unit. And uh, that whole unit at 6.30 last Saturday uh, went up in flames. And there were 18 fire trucks here, uh, 60 firemen, and they were still pouring water into the roof um, 24 hours later. So very sad to, to hear that. Um, I hope... Uh, their uh, their business will will be okay. Uh, maybe some of the delays we've heard in the industry uh, mean that stock wasn't in there. Um, fortunately, no one was hurt. So uh, that's a bit of a uh, live broadcast here from Barwell Business Park. So back to the evolution of the electric bicycle. This is something I'm quite passionate about. Um, so if we talk about e-bike uh, one point oh, so this was. Uh, you know, back in back in the day, I, I think these people were were the visionaries. Um, I consider myself a pioneer in the industry, but I think these guys in e-bike 1.0 were the visionaries. Yeah, you know, e-bikes were invented in China um, by the uh, cheap cheap uh, transport, and they started to make their way over to the U.S. and and Europe. And I think interestingly, the U.S. market in some ways I think was almost ahead of the European market. Uh, with regard to, to e-bike 1.0. Uh, you might have been familiar with uh, um, Lee Iacocca's um, global EV or EV global company, where he had the, the visionary approach to um, sell e-bikes in uh, car dealerships. Um, maybe, yeah, I say I'm 10 years too early in the industry. Maybe he was 20 or, or 30 years too early. But certainly uh, something that's very topical now. I mean, I, there are a lot of people talking about how electric bikes uh, may well become uh, part of an intermodal transport system. And uh, Lee Iacocca and e-bike 1.0 uh, had, that, had that vision. Of course, these products were really, really heavy. Um, they were mainly lead acid batteries. Um, they were 60, 70, 80 pounds. And they were just basically Chinese inventions uh, brought over to the Western market um, based on the, the uh, idea that uh, Western consumer would 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 buy them, and, and they were somewhat successful. But of course, the weight and well, maybe you could say the the styling or the the uh, that that, that uh, perhaps uh, uh, Asia is not known for at at, at that time um, held those products back. But there was also the uh, Zap electric bike, and and there were a lot of kits going on. So um, I I remember I think I'm one of the I only invest in Go Cycle now, but back then I, I could see electric bikes being hot, and I think I was actually one of the um, the, the sad people that invested in the Zap.com or, or e-bike um, company. I think, which uh, I think uh, went under. Uh, under, but uh, these were the the early days, um, and and from a design perspective, you know, it's quite interesting because there were a lot of 
uh, e-bike 1.0 mid drives. Um, and as we get into e-bike 2.0, uh, mid, mid drives um, were, were not actually a, a mainstay, I would say. So very early on, you, know, you had the Japanese uh, Yamaha system and the uh, Honda was even making a few um, compact uh, folding e-bikes uh, and they were all uh, mid-drive based. Um, but I think uh, technology-wise, you know, they were very much about low-cost transport in, in Asia and uh, performance in terms of weight, in terms of uh, living with the product beyond it just taking you from A to B. Uh, all those things were, were secondary. Um, Anyway, so uh, e-bike 1.0 was, was um, probably from up until I would say about 2005. Now I started to become quite interested in electric bikes uh, around 2000, 2001, 2002 uh, when, I, when I started the company. And uh, I could see that, uh, yeah, these things were gonna be um, quite a big deal, but uh, there was a lot to do in terms of getting them to be um, a, a really useful product and something that would be attractive for, for Western consumers. A big, a big part was the weight. And obviously at that time, even uh, nickel metal hydride batteries, while they did offer a, a, a big weight improvement over lead acid, uh, it was still gonna give you something that was um, not as light as we have uh, today. So that, uh, that was part of the, the, the era that uh, inspired me. I guess I thought, hey, uh, you know, I know how to build lightweight components. Um, if I combine my skill set that I had working in the motor racing industry, working with composite parts to, uh, to tackle this, this problem of an e-bike for the Western market, you know, I, I, I really thought I had an opportunity there. Probably a little bit too early, but better to be early than too late. So that, that uh, sort of takes us on to what I call e-bike 2.0. And I think the e-bike 2.0, this is, this is, these are the pioneers, right? The, these are the, uh, the companies that really started to um, tackle that uh, Chinese invention or the Chinese format, which was basically, uh, I, I'll throw the Japanese in there also. They were obviously doing e-bikes then era. They were, they were pushing the mid, mid drives, but you know, mid drives are a more complex um, um, item to actually bring to market. And so e-bike 2.0, where a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs and companies started to see e-bikes were gonna be big, they got involved, but the more simple solution, or uh, probably the lighter weight solution at the time, um, and uh, the more straightforward solution that matched easily with uh, bicycle frames on how they were making. The bicycle industry you know, needs uh, traditional frames and uh, drivetrain makers, battery makers, and the infrastructure was not really set up for that other than hub, hub drives. So e-bike 2.0 was very much about um, hub drives. Uh, you, you, I think e-bike 2.0 for me was maybe one of the most innovative periods in the e-bike development. Maybe, maybe there'll be periods of innovation coming ahead of us, but I would say definitely uh, e-bike 2.0 between say 2005 to 2015 uh, produced the most varied um, uh, uh, solutions to the, to the problem. You know, you had front drives, you had rear drives, you had huge washing machine motor drives. Um, it was all about power also. It, it reminded me, e-bike 2.0 reminded me a lot of like the Group B rally car days where there was just extreme amounts of horsepower and, and the cars were extremely uh, hard to control. Very exciting though. Um, I'm just seeing that we've got a connection failure here. I'm gonna keep going. Um, so e-bike, uh, so, so e-bike 2.0 was, um, uh, quite an interesting period, and, and going to uh, to uh, trade shows such as Eurobike, uh, you could see. Um, oh, I've just got a note that we're still good. Sorry about that. Uh, so when you were going to um, uh, to Eurobike, for example, it was just incredible the amount of variety of of product that you saw. I thought it was really a neat neat period in the e bikes development. Well, companies were trying di all different sizes of 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 different bikes. 
I particularly, one that stood out for me um, was I remember the Wavecrest Tidal, uh, Tidal Force e-bike, which had these two enormous um, uh, uh, battery motor combinations in each wheel. Um, and it was, it was quite a distinctive looking product. Um, you got the feeling that it was two wheel drive. I don't know if it was, I think one was, was actually a, a, a battery. I'm sure there's someone uh, watching that knows more about it than I do. Um, but that, that was, a, I think, a, kind of a, a sign of, of the innovation that was happening. And, and you had the start of um, a great product like the Stromer that came on. And um, uh, you also had, uh, I think, another interesting one was um, the German Grace e-bike, which was, again, it was very, you know, the, the top tube, I think, was about this big around. Um, and uh, the motor was enormous. It, I think the light on the e-bike on the e was bigger than the motor. Um, but it was quite a machine, and, and people, I think, were just going for it um, on, on the basis that uh, they could see e-bikes were going to be this, this next big thing and trying to throw every known solution out there. So I think uh, e-bike 2.0 is a, a really, really e e exciting time. You also have that very tiny um, uh, down-tube uh, um, drive system in, in, a mount in one of the mountain bikes, and I think later it was allegedly um, part of... Um, uh, electric doping in in, in certain um, uh, cyclocross races and things. So so much innovation. But what stood out to me was that um, there wasn't too much around mid drives. You know, it was all uh, front and and rear drives. Um, you know, Bionics. The Bionics system was another really well integrated uh, kit that uh, you saw a lot of in e-bike 2.0. Uh, and I, I, I really, the, I think the theme here is, is that uh, it was about diversity and it was about the, the choice. The customer, I don't think, yet knew what an e-bike was, the, the early majority or the, the um, mainstream consumer. Wasn't really sure because they would, you know, show up to a, a trade show or, or an e-bike event and there'd be all these different, um, different mount, uh, uh, bicycles. Mountain bikes were still not... Um, really electrified at this time. And I would say that most of the pioneers in e-bike 2.0 were the people that said, yeah, e-bikes are, are gonna be a thing. Uh, and a lot of the companies in e-bike 3.0, um, and I think were more of the late, late adopters within the industry, uh, sort of, okay, yeah, maybe, we'll wait till the market picks up and then we'll come in. So that, that kind of takes us through to um, what I would consider e-bike uh, 3.0. And uh, this is really where I would say the big players moved in. And in one word, the, the Bosch drive, right? I think I remember in, um, in Eurobike coming from e-bike 2.0 the year before to e-bike 3.0. And suddenly the number of hub drives, for example, you could count on one, one hand. And everything, you know, Bosch had been working on this drive for a long time, uh, very, very refined. So, and, and also integrated with the supply chain. So, you know, that buy-in from manufacturers making frames so that everyone could use their same geometry and be able to bolt on the system uh, in the, uh, the typical sort of um, uh, very efficient but pick and mix approach of the, the cycling industry uses. Um, and you, you really, at that point, I, I felt like you could see, okay, the e-bike now is, is commoditized. <clears throat> in terms of the Western uh, consumer. So the variant, the difference was striking between say the Chinese e-bike, which, you know, the e-bike was invented probably there of um, very simple approach, A to B cost, um, uh, also about reliability. And that's basically a, a hub, hub drive system to a Western approach to it, which was uh, driven by Bosch, very, very experienced engineering company, uh, taking a, a, an automotive engineering approach to the problem. Uh, maybe uh, very much about, hey, this is more about a mountain bike and the use for a mountain bike rather than the, uh, the road bikes or, or trail bikes that I would say dominated e-bike 2.0. E-bike 3.0 was very much about, you know, downhill, uh, how to get up the hill quickly and easily and have a great time uh, going downhill. So that, that was a, a, a big shift. And the, the commoditized format, I think, was 
that that's probably the most uh, the most important part of eBuy 3.0. Uh, you're starting to see also a lot more integration. So you in eBuy 2.0 you got people making motors and then someone else is doing the controller and the battery. And in eBike 3.0, you've got um, a player providing the whole drive system, including the battery, the charger, um, and the electronics. So there's a lot more integration and sophistication uh, involved. And also uh, at eBike 3.0, you, you shifted from say, twist and go e-bikes to a much more Pedelec if that's a European term, Pedelec-driven uh, approach where people are sensing torque in the pedals. And um, in, a, in a sense, much more conformance to uh, the European idea of what a, an electric bike, bicycle should be. The, if I just kind of diverge a bit, the US has had a different approach to the, the legal framework for e-bikes. Probably, I think, a lot more flexible and ultimately gives the consumer and, um, and, and uh, designers and companies a lot more flexibility to find the right product for the usage. Um, but nevertheless, the, with so much momentum from the European uh, industry and, and the Bosch center drive, that really you know, has gone over to the US in, in, in a big way. Obviously, there, there are lots of different advantages to and disadvantages to mid drives over hub drives. A um, little bit more weight in a mid drive um, but the advantages of being able to select gear, gears. So in a mountain bike where you're used to going through the gears all the time, that makes perfect sense. For an urban bike where maybe you're doing a lot more stop starting and the, the customer usage is less in tune with what gears do, um, the hub drives have, have uh, more of an advantage, a little bit lighter also. So I think, I think e-bike 3.0 is really as I said, commoditized the e-bike and taken that into the early majority. I wouldn't say mainstream yet, but getting there, uh, the early majority. So you can see when people show up to um, a trade show or an event that in some ways the e-bike 3.0 looks like a normal bike. It may be a bit heavier, but you know there's been a lot more integration into um, fitting the, the bottom bracket drives in there. Um, and from a distance, surely, uh, people, hey, this is like a, a normal bike. Certainly, geometries uh, for suspension and downhill have been far less affected, uh, and the performance of the product are far less affected for downhill mountain bikes with um, with e-bike 3.0. So uh, that basically uh, takes us to uh, e-bike 4.0, and what I see is uh, some of the stuff that's coming down the pipeline. I, I'm not sure when e-bike 4.0 is going to come. It may just be a transition. Whereas e-bike 2.0 to 3.0 was quite a big step. It was like a lot of innovation and then bang, you know, the, the mid-drive commodity e-bike was there. So e-bike 4.0, I think, is really about refinement. I think you're also uh, going to see a constant weight reduction where, you know, the bicycle industry is an incredible machine in terms of evolutionary approach every year, chipping away grams. Um, some of the product you see out there is, is really sophisticated. There's a lot more integration now. Um, and I think that's going to continue. But along with that, I think you're also going to see a lot of price erosion. Because with that commoditized framework of what an e-bike is, um, when you stack them all next to each other, whether it's a downhill mountain bike or a, a trail bike, they all look the same. And there's a huge amount of competition, as we know, in the cycling industry. And I think you're with, with refinement, you're going to get into some price erosion uh, that's going to happen. Weight, I think, is going to be a, a, a big one. Weight at, at a refinement level, weight is uh, a trade-off in the sense of uh, cost. It's difficult to reduce weight on, um, in the bicycle industry without the costs going up. Um, but uh, maybe the competition factor will just thin margins down for, for everyone. So you might see weight come down and, and price erosion uh, happen. I think one of the big things is going to be, um, you know, the industry is now fully on board with electric bikes and designers that may have not been totally on board with electric bikes are now probably looking at it as, hey, I've got this power source on this vehicle. What else can I do uh, with that energy source? 
So I think you might see a lot more, um, I mean, we've seen a little bit with um, anti-lock brakes. Uh, some companies have come up with that. Uh, more development in automated shifting, um, uh, electronic shifting, um, because you've got a power source on there that you can use. Obviously, the, the lighting systems and um, integration, that's, that's already started to happen uh, with day, daytime running lights. I think you're going to see um, a lot more companies with apps uh, integrated into their system. You know, we were probably the first company that I know of uh, in the industry to launch uh, an app. We launched that in 2011 with the G2. Um, that was the first production app-connected uh, e-bike. But of course, now there, there are many, many um, e-bikes that have apps, and I think you're going to see much more integration with that. I think also you're going to see uh, this connection with health coming into it. And e-bike 4.0, I think, is going to be, people are going to realize that if you want to be serious about your fitness, and you know, we all know that uh, well-being and health is, uh, nev has never been more important than now. Um, so you're going to see maybe some more integration with that the e-bike is um, not something that's going to make you unfit. but having an e-bike and being connected with this app and maybe you've got a continuous glucose monitor and you've got a heart rate and blood pressure thing going on and how you ride your e-bike and having all that health step uh, data connecting together, I think is going to be part of e-bike 4.0. I think also things like security, you know, a lot of uh, security systems like GPS and tracking, uh, that's going to, you know, uh, spread out. Um, I think there's been a lot of development of that in the electric uh, shared scooter industry, um, and that's going to percolate over. The costs are still quite high, and there's still a problem globally finding a universal uh, um, carrier. So that, um, and, and that's a problem with, with, with that companies are still have to have different contracts in different regions, which makes it quite uh, tricky to roll that out on on mass. And then there's also the challenge of whose responsibility is it to go and collect it and do you want to put your customer in touch with a thief uh, on and, and the ramifications of that. But certainly tracking and anti-theft, maybe there are going to be systems that lock wheels and, and, and bottom brackets that are running off the power supply. Uh, difficult to, to design and keep the weight down, which is important on, on bicycles. But I think that's going to be part of, of e-bike 4.0. So I'm, I'm getting ready uh, to, to wrap this up, um, and maybe there's some questions. Um, but a couple of more thoughts on, on the future of e-bikes. E uh, I think for a big breakthrough in weight, we probably need to wait for graphene or something like that. We need a breakthrough in materials. There's a lot people can do if you're not cooking with the same ingredients to make things different. Um, uh, and, and reduce weight by the geometry of the part. But because the e-bike has been commoditized, um, it's very difficult to reduce the weight unless you're dealing with um, really new, new materials. I think battery breakthroughs, I'm not sure that's going to be a big deal in e-bike 4.0. Batteries are already quite light, and the problem you've got with batteries is you've got um, the, the, the danger that comes with the rapid development of those. So I think e-bike makers are going to be really reluctant to take on new battery technology. Um, uh, we're not, we're definitely not seeing the 20% increase in cell capacity every every year that we were seeing in e-bike 2.0 and 3.0. So that's definitely going to tail off. We're not going to see breakthroughs there. And if there is a battery breakthrough, uh, as I said, I think e-bike manufacturers are going to be very reluctant to use them. E-bikes don't have the same standards uh, as, uh, for example, a, a car. And one of the areas that the e-bike industry could do better on is some um, the more robust standards around uh, battery packs um, and um, and really understanding that some of these bikes are left down on the beach for days or left out in the rain. And there there needs to be more more testing around there. I think e-bike 4.0 is also unfortunately going to make it more difficult for smaller players to come into the market because of regulation and, and, and safety legislation. Already the tests are really high in terms of the standard and all the things you have to do, EMC testing, everything like that. 
So uh, it's uh, it's the market's definitely maturing. I wouldn't say it's uh, um, majority yet. I think we're early majority, but that's uh, e-bike 4.0 is going to be a difficult playground for uh, newcomers. Anyway, thanks very much for uh, uh, letting me speak here, uh, and thanks for all of you that attended. If you've got any questions, I'm here for a little bit, and I'll try and pick some off if I can uh, learn how to operate this uh, machine here. Okay, good question from Neil. Um, will regeneration braking become common? Um, very good question. We're asked that all the time. It is actually uh, a secret uh, uh, hope of, of mine that we do crack re re regeneration braking. I think we have a shot at doing it. I think we've got the technology and the expertise at GoCycle to do it. And we have something that uh, the, most of the commoditized e-bikes don't have. We have a hub drive system. Of course, with the bottom bracket system, you're never going to have regen braking unless you want people to regenerate their, their battery with their uh, pedals. But regen braking um, has the penalty of weight and complexity. And typically, you're only getting 10 or 20% for recovery of the, of the energy. But for a city bike and an urban bike that's doing a lot of stop-start traffic, my trade-off is, is about weight. Our DNA is about trying to keep uh, lightweight um, in, in the mix there. So at the point that you can add regeneration braking, take off some battery capacity, and still get from A to B through a city, stop and start, with the same uh, same range, I think that would be a neat crossover point in that technology. I don't know what that would cost, um, and that's the other factor. So, so great question. Okay, another question from Reed Smith. Hey, Richard, uh, what needs to happen for mid-drive to become an entry-level affordable option as opposed to the normal entry-level hub drive as it sits now? So I think... Um, I mean, we've been looking at mid-drives for a couple of years, and our crossover for mid-drive is about weight. Uh, maybe not so, so much cost at this time, because I think the, the materials that you need to use um, in the bottom bracket area, because you're dealing with higher torque, right? If you put your, your, um, your drive system in the wheels, you're, you, you can deal with a lower amount of torque. The, the legs of the human leg is, is enormously, enormously efficient for producing huge amount of torque, 100, 200 newton meters at, at very slow speed. So the materials you have to use there have to be very strong. And that means typically a lot of them are, are steels. Um, um, but, you know, Shimano, whether they did this on purpose and had this planned all along, I don't know. But they've got now one of the, one of the lightest mid-drive systems out there. And while our hub drive is still probably half the weight, um, you know, you can see that there's evolution going on in, in that direction. So I think um, if you get to, and, and you can see that more, more mid-drives have um, plastic molded gears. So while the investment's very high, um, you can get the lower cost in terms of the, the gearing system. There's still a lot of gear reduction that needs to go on. That means precise bearings. That means multiple stages. However you're doing it, um, and you've got to compact that into a very small package. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be a, an OEM mid-drive maker. I think there's a huge amount of competition there. Um, and I think, to answer your question, I think that's where... Um, the, the price is going to come down. And it'll be at the expense of, of margins, probably, um, because someone's got to grab the volume and get the volume up. But there's so much competition that um, everyone might be having a small amount of, of uh, supply. Certainly, if you're a bicycle manufacturer right now, you're dealing with extreme challenges in the supply chain. And if you're linked with one bottom drive maker, you know, your business is at, at a big risk um, if they have a supply problem. So, you know, building a range of bicycles with different, um, ma different mid-drives is probably going to be the mode of operandi, and, and therefore your volumes are going to be small, your pricing is not going to be as good. So that's a great question. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer other than uh, uh, competition driving down price. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, again, thanks for joining today. Um, 
for those of you still still around, I'll give you a sneak peek of the uh, the G4. Um, I'm only allowed to show you a certain amount um, of the new fork. So there's our light. That's our new carbon fork integrated light. Our new uh, Moto GP inspired tires. Uh, really, really nice. Thank you very much.